Thanks, Elaine. It's, uh, it's really good to be here. I've, uh, I've been to this uh, program before as a spectator, and uh, it does have its advantages actually being on that side of the, uh, of the podium as well, and I hope to go back there in just a few minutes. But, um, but I'm glad to be here to talk a little bit about, uh, about my own work, um, uh, to put it in the context of the other Southern voices that we've uh, uh, been hearing this morning and last night with uh, Carl and Doug and Tina and Charles, and we've got more coming this afternoon, and it's a great uh, uh, thrill and pleasure for me to be uh, part of that. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit this morning about my own reasons for becoming a writer. Um, I'll talk some about the book on Jimmy Carter if you want to ask uh, questions about it, but I'm actually going to read from two other uh, works that I'll tell you about um, uh, in a minute as well. Um, I think the reason that I decided to become a writer, and it was not an instant decision, it was not like I wanted to do it from the time I was a little kid, but I loved stories. Um, I loved to read and I loved to listen to stories. And I grew up in a family of storytellers, and the most prominent among them was my grandfather, who was the, the last of the great family patriarchs, at least in our family. Uh, he was a man who practiced law uh, and won his last case before the Alabama Supreme Court at the age of 99. Um, he was born in 1856, and he died in 1959. I was 13 when he died, and, and for the last years of his life, uh, I listened to him tell stories about his own boyhood, which occurred during the time of the Civil War. At the time that this was happening, it, I just kind of assumed that everybody's grandfather remembered the Civil War and told <laughs> stories about it, and so it didn't seem all that remarkable to me, but the stories stuck, and his ability to tell them stayed with me. But later on, uh, it seemed to me that there was a great flaw in this whole experience of growing up in an Old South, Deep South, white Southern family. Uh, there was very much and very intentionally a part of the status quo in the South. And I started thinking about this at several different occasions, but one of them that was perhaps the most important of all occurred uh, just up the road in downtown Birmingham. I had come there on a high school field trip. I was 16 years old, and it was the spring of 1963. And I knew that great and tumultuous events were taking place uh, in Alabama at that time, and particularly in Birmingham with the civil rights demonstrations that were going on. But I was 16, and I had other things on my mind, like uh, uh, the University of Alabama football and uh, uh, collecting baseball cards and uh, increasingly that half of the human population that was interestingly different from my half. Um, and so I really hadn't thought very much about the civil rights movement until uh, a Friday afternoon I was walking in downtown Birmingham on this field trip and I stumbled upon uh, through no premeditation at all the arrest of Dr. Martin Luther King. And he was being shoved up the sidewalk by a pair of Birmingham policemen who clearly enjoyed their assignment that day. They seemed as harsh and um, mean-spirited to me uh, just looking at their faces. And it was almost frightening for a kid uh, who had led a relatively sheltered life, I assume. Um, and they shoved Dr. King along as far as from me to the edge of the stage from where I was standing. And I could see quite clearly the look on his face. And I don't know what I expected to see. Perhaps I expected to see anger, or maybe I expected to see fear. Um, I certainly felt a little flash of fear just watching it. Um, but what I thought I saw instead, and what my mind, my 16-year-old mind took a picture of that never left, uh, was a look of deep sadness and resignation. I remember that he had large, dark, expressive eyes. And and I could never get that image out of my mind. Um, and, I, and I began to think about it um, in, a, in a quite private way, uh, not talking much about it to, to friends and family. And I went off to college, and the movement gained intensity, and my curiosity uh, grew deeper. And I remember reading in an English class the uh, acceptance speech that uh, 
William Faulkner gave when he got the Nobel Prize in which he said that the only thing worth writing about was the human heart in conflict with itself. And it seemed to me at that time that the collective heart of the American South, the state of Alabama, the people in my own family, was in a state of deep conflict with itself. And I realized that this was something that I wanted to write about. And so I did that as a newspaper reporter in the early stages of my career, uh, and then had the opportunity, as Elaine said a few years ago, to come back uh, and write a book about the civil rights movement in Alabama and the pivotal role that Alabama played. And it was an opportunity to write about the great iconic figures like Dr. King and Rosa Parks and others, Fred Shuttlesworth and others who came out of Alabama. But I also realized early on in the research something that I'd kind of known all along anyway, that this was a movement of thousands of people in which ordinary people did extraordinary things. And so I wanted to interview and, and track down the stories of as many of these ordinary people as I could. And the book Cradle of Freedom is really dedicated to those ordinary people um, who, who did something so extraordinary they raised the most fundamental questions about who we were and who we wanted to be. And we were able at the end of that movement to give answers that were so much better than those that we could give at the beginning of that movement. And so I wrote with a sense of gratitude and respect for these uh, folks that came um, certainly straight from my heart. And I'm going to read a short passage uh, this morning uh, from Cradle of Freedom that's about uh, a young girl, uh, or she was a young girl at the time, uh, she was 11 years old at the time of the Bloody Sunday March, the first attempt to march from Selma to Montgomery in 1965. Um, and the uh, uh, state troopers of George Wallace and Al Lingo were waiting for the peaceful demonstrators and attacked them with tear gas and clubs and horses. And I write about this scene which is uh, was, was videotaped and shown to people and is a very famous scene, but I write about it uh, from the point of view of an 11-year-old girl who was caught in the middle of it. By this time, everything was chaos, and somewhere back near the summit of the bridge, Joanne Bland was caught in the middle of it. Joanne was 11. It was not her first civil rights protest, for she was like a lot of other, other children in Selma, Alabama, who had listened to the exhortations of the civil rights leaders and reveled in their role as the movement's foot soldiers. James Perkins, who would later become the city's first black mayor, remembered being what he called a seasoned protester at the age of 12. Joanne herself had already been arrested 13 times, and she had come to enjoy it. At least as ardently as any of her peers, she detested the practice of racial segregation the glib assumption by every white person she had ever known that black people simply didn't matter as much. Once her grandmother had sent her to the grocery store for some food and the clerk was weighing her packet of ground beef when he stopped in the middle to wait on a white woman. Joanne was worried because her grandmother had told her not to tarry and she was afraid she would lose the old woman's trust. But when she got back home, her grandmother didn't scold. Don't worry, baby, she said with a sigh. Soon we won't have to do that anymore. So Joanne was happy to be a part of the movement, and until that moment at the Edmund Pettus Bridge, she thought it was the greatest adventure of her childhood. But now all of a sudden she was caught in a horror she could barely comprehend. Trapped on a bridge a hundred feet above the river, with people screaming and Sheriff Jim Clark and his posse on horseback lashing out blindly at everybody who was black. She thought that some of the men had horrible faces, like monsters almost, as they galloped through a cloud that was making people choke. Later, somebody explained what had happened, how the troopers had fired their canisters of tear gas and how they were wearing gas masks to protect themselves from the power of the fumes. As Joanne was watching all this unfold, she saw an old woman trying to get away and a mounted deputy bearing down upon her. Joanne tried to call out a warning but it was too late. The woman was trampled and hit her head on the pavement of the Edmund Pettus Bridge, and Joanne heard the, thick, heard the sickening crack of her skull. Somehow she was sure that must have been the sound, and she could hear it 
clearly above all the screams. But later she wondered if it had been her own head, for she fainted dead away from the terror of the scene. Oops. It was a uh, great privilege to write about these uh, folks who, whose actions made up this movement. Um, and I often feel that way about people that I get a chance to write about because one of the things you realize if you're a, a journalist turned historian and try to take that calling at all seriously is that the literary possibilities and the literal truth, that is the ability to develop characters and to tell stories and to use dialogue, all of those things can be done without departing deliberately from the literal truth. Uh, and, and the power of those stories, it's like, um, it's like it just kind of pours through you if you listen carefully to what people are telling you. So I love the opportunity to do that. And the opportunity has taken, uh, I've been very lucky in the places that it has taken me, uh, to Plains, Georgia, to talk to uh, uh, President Jimmy Carter uh, to uh, uh, try to make some sense of his uh, of his presidency that didn't work out as well as he and other people had hoped, and the extraordinary post presidency that he has built. Um, there are some people who say that Carter is the only uh, American president to use that office as a stepping stone to greatness, um, and I think there is some truth to that. And I've tried to capture it in the in the book Profit from Plains. But I want to close this morning uh, before uh, opening up to questions by uh, talking about uh, another book that actually just arrived. Um, I just got my co first copy of it Wednesday. Uh, it's a book called With Music and Justice for All. And it's a collection of profiles and essays, memoir and historical and journalistic tidbits about the American South as I've had a chance to, to write about it for what my friends uh, call the last hundred years. Um, and, uh, and there are stories in here of, uh, of people from the realms of religion, uh, some well-known people like Billy Graham, um, people from the uh, world of music like Johnny Cash, uh, from the world of politics, from the uh, world of civil rights and social change. But the book ends at a place where my sense of storytelling really began, and that's with my own family. And I'm going to read a piece that is a, is a kind of piece of memoir about a Saturday morning that I remember at my grandfather's house. Um, I had gone there that Saturday morning, as I often did, um, to, I was five years old, and I, I often went and hung out with my grandfather and a, a man, a black man, who worked for him, whose name was Robert Crochon. Robert was kind of a gardener for the family uh, and had worked uh, for the family for about 50 years at that point. Uh, he was not as old as my grandfather, but he was getting up there. And the two of them worked side by side in the 1950s, and they were close friends of a sort. Uh, and yet there was a flaw in that friendship that we all at one point had to wrestle with. And I'm going to read a little bit about that and close my opening uh, with this. <clears throat> Robert, my grandfather, had told him more than once, you've been blessed with good ability. Don't let anybody think they're better than you are. Even years later, Robert had no doubt that my grandfather meant it. But on the Saturday I'm remembering, all of us came face to face, suddenly and without any warning with the myopia and contradictions of the times. After a morning spent in the garden, it was time for lunch, and we headed for the big house, as my grandfather's dwelling was known in those days. The extended family was beginning to gather, and it was an impressive spread on the dining room table. Fried chicken, turnip greens, a platter of biscuits. But as we took our places around the great cluttered feast, Robert found a chair by himself in the kitchen. To a five-year-old, it made no sense. Robert, I called, come on in here. I knew immediately that I had made a mistake, for my aunt quickly shot me a look that could kill. Shame on you, she said with a hiss. Shame on you for hurting Robert's feelings. It was my first encounter with the great Southern sin, and I remembered the moment, moment as the years went by, and the Civil Rights Movement descended on the South. 
I was a teenager when the movement hit its stride, and for me at least, those festering doubts that began when I was five, the secret suspicions that the world around me didn't make a lot of sense, finally erupted into full-blown rebellion. What I didn't know until many years later was that my grandfather was struggling with the same set of issues, the same misgivings about the Southern way of life. His struggle played out most clearly in the church, for my grandfather was a man of deep faith. Every night in the big house, precisely at nine, he would take his place in the rocking chair by the hearth and thumb through the, page, the well-worn pages of his Bible, selecting verses to be read aloud. The Psalms were his favorites, those bits of poetry that were written by kings, but there were others also that were scattered through the book, the words of the prophets and the Sermon on the Mount. He served as an elder in the Presbyterian Church, an office he had held for 65 years, and his minister, John Crowell, was a learned young man of stunning eloquence with the kindest heart the old man had ever known. He was one of a handful of Alabama ministers who preached a few sermons on the issue of race, calling essentially for an end to segregation. For many years, my grandfather disagreed. He had grown accustomed to the codes of segregation, which seemed to him to resemble what God had intended, and many of his fellow church members concurred. And yet they were drawn to this brilliant young preacher with his spellbinding words and a faith that was clearly a match for their own. Perhaps the most basic issue they faced was what to do on Sunday if a black person came to worship at the church. Would he be made welcome, <clears throat> or as some in the congregation suggested, turned away in deference to the Southern way of life? To the minister, of course, the answer was clear, for he regarded segregation in any form as wrong, a patent affront to the message of the Bible. His stance, however, drew fire from many of the people of the church until the day my grandfather rose to speak. Palmer Gilliard was an amazing figure at the age of 99, nearly six feet one if a little bit stooped, with clothes that were beginning to sag on his frame. But his voice was strong as he cleared his throat and proclaimed that the minister this time was right. Even in the days of their ancestors, he said, slaves had been allowed to worship in the balconies, and surely today they would not retreat from the generosity of their fathers. But more than that, they should also remember that our Lord looks not on the color of skin, but on the quality of a man's heart and his character and his soul. It was a powerful performance, as it usually was when the old man spoke, as if his words somehow should be inscribed on a tablet. And yet it left the young minister perplexed. In John Crowell's mind, the leap was so small from such professions of faith to a support for the end of segregation in the South. But my grandfather resisted that connection. Kindness was one thing, a welcoming spirit at a ch Sunday church service, but racial equality was something else again. And For the rest of his life, he wrote letters and articles supporting segregated schools and public transportation and limits on the right of black people to vote. He and Crowell continued to debate it until the day in 1959 when the minister got word that the old man was dying. It was a day he had dreaded for more than a decade, the end of a life so spirited and grand. And he drove out quickly to the house on the hill just west of Mobile. The old man was now 103, and he looked so fragile as he lay in the bed, his breathing shallow and his skin ghost white. He couldn't have weighed more than 100 pounds, and his voice when he spoke was barely a whisper. The preacher took his seat on the side of the bed, and my grandfather slowly reached out his hand. Pastor, he whispered, letting the word hang there as he gathered his breath, I must tell you now, I see that you were right. There were just the two of them in the half-darkened room where the shadows fell softly on the old man's bed. He didn't say anything after that, just shut his eyes as the preacher held his hand, and the next morning he was gone. As the 1950s drew to a close, John Crowell thought often about that confession, and it somehow gave him reason to hope. My grandfather was such a symbol of the South, <clears throat> he had lived through more than half its history, if you began counting time from the founding of the country. And he had 
seen everything since the great civil war and the temporary upheavals of reconstruction and the eventual restoration of his family and his race and he was proud of the legacy he had sought to pass on that code of honor and generosity and kindness but in the clarity of those final moments of his life he may have understood that it was not enough john crowell thought so and the question he believed for the american south confronted with the darker implications of its past whether those still living could understand it as well. Many years later, I told that story to Robert Crochon. He was an old man himself by then, having worked for my family for more than 60 years. I had kept up with him as the years went by, visiting whenever I came back to Mobile, and marveling at his gentle dignity and strength. He could have been bitter, as I knew very well, but he had simply rejected that option, perhaps for his own sake as much as those around him. It was clear as we talked that he understood the limits of my grandfather's vision, as well as the cruelty at the heart of segregation. But when I told him the story of the deathbed confession, the story I had recently learned from the minister, Robert simply smiled. Your grandfather, he said, was a good, kind man. I decided to push him on that point, for despite my childhood reverence for my grandfather, I had also seen his inconsistency his ability to work side by side with Robert, treating him apparently as a friend, and then to sentence him to dinner alone in the kitchen. And while he supported in principle allowing black people to worship in his church, he also supported the laws of segregation, understanding quite well the effect of those laws on the white man's world. <clears throat> Sorry about my voice, I've had a cold. Robert nodded as I spoke and offered what I knew was a wistful smile. That was a different day, he said, and things are better now. And so they are. <clears throat> the thing that Robert Crochon understood and affirmed several times in the course of our talks was that civility and kindness were a powerful force in the South even then, tied to the religious heart of the place. When the Civil Rights Movement finally came along, demanding simple justice as the price of racial peace, there were too many people like my grandfather, resistant at first, but eventually and inevitably worn down by the truth. Oddly enough, it was Robert Crochon and not the family he worked for who saw the whole thing coming from the start. Thank you very much. Thanks. I know this is a short session, so I don't want to keep you too long and uh, give you a chance to eat lunch. But if anybody has if there are a question or two, I'll be happy to, uh, to answer. Yes, sir. Um, I was with Carter on three different, at three different periods of time. Um, back in the uh, 1980s um, for the Charlotte Observer, I wrote what I think was the first Serious, serious retrospective on Carter to appear in an American newspaper. And I interviewed him three times for that for a total of probably five hours um, and interviewed a lot of people who worked for him. And then in the 1990s, I wrote a book on Habitat for Humanity, which Carter was very involved with and interviewed him again for that. And then spent another hour or two with him when I was pulling all that together uh, to write this book. So, and then uh, Nancy and I went to to see him. Um, this is a cool thing to do if you ever have the opportunity. Carter um, teaches Sunday school every Sunday that he's in Plains, Georgia at Maranatha Baptist Church. And you can go on that website. I'm sorry my voice is pooping out here, but you can go on the website and find out when he's going to be there. And it's really quite amazing. You, he's completely unpretentious about it. You sit a few feet away from him and he does his Sunday school lesson. So I did that too. So all in all, I guess I've spent eight or ten hours with him and, you know, a fair amount of time with people who know him and, and, and researching the, uh, the archives and that kind of thing. It was a good experience. He's, he's, uh, he's a really interesting guy. He's not, in my experience, as warm and fuzzy as his supporters kind of see him as being, although he can be warm and he can be very... Um, open and that kind of thing and, and reaching out particularly to people who uh, are, live in unfortunate circumstances. Um, he also has a kind of engineer's mind and he likes to get from point A to point B um, and if you're in the way you can get jostled aside. It's very... <laughs> yes, sir. 
Um, almost exactly. Um, he, um, um, he, the book you're talking about is Palestine, Peace, Not Apartheid, which is very critical of the, uh, some of the settlement policies of, of Israel. Um, Carter has rejected the option uh, of, um, of, of being the elder statesman above the fray. Um, it's like he's too, um, he's too, he's so caught up in the immediate problems of the moment that matter so much to him. And he has a growing sense, I think, that at the age of 82, he's running out of time to address them. So he says what he thinks and lets the chips fall. And uh, uh, even at the uh, at least short run cost to his own uh, legacy and standing uh, in, the, in, in the country. Um, I, I've never seen anybody uh, who worries less uh, about, uh, uh, about how he's perceived by other people. Um, there was a, a sense of Carter as president that some journalists had that he was kind of irresolute. And I thought the opposite was true, that he was so sure of what he thought he should be doing and saying that he almost thought it would sell itself and didn't feel the need to sort of explain it and package it in the symbols of the media age for uh, uh, for for public consumption. Uh, he just let it out there and uh, sometimes it worked and sometimes he didn't. And, um, but he was never in much doubt about his own, uh, he, I mean he had an ability to listen to critics and wasn't threatened by them, but he, he was always pretty sure he was right. Did I see a hand back this way? No. Okay. Who, oh yes, okay. Right. And I wonder if you're continuing in your wonderful work to evaluate that and track that um, To some extent. I mean, there, there's, a, there's a sense, I think, that a lot of us have, that we have made a lot of progress, but that the rate of progress may, may be um, diminishing. Um, and, you know, it's not even just in this country, but you look at the whole world, and it's like the frontier of, of civilization is, uh, is the need for people who are not exactly alike to live in proximity in a shrinking world, and the world doesn't do a very good job of that. We probably do a better job in this country, and yet at the same time, um, there's a sense that I think I share with you that we're losing ground on some fronts. Um, I, I think the, uh, the immigration debate uh, that we're having now um, uh, is a terrible example of, uh, I mean, I understand there are serious issues about immigration that need to be addressed, but but there's a kind of xenophobia at the heart of some of what's being said, I think, that I find very reminiscent of the, of the rhetoric uh, opposed to the civil rights movement in the 1960s, and it's quite, it's quite scary to me. Um, I also like to celebrate um, it, it departures from this gloomy prognosis and uh, have recently been uh, working on a book about the uh, little fishing village of Viola Battery, Alabama, which is... Uh, just south of Mobile, and uh, there are about 2,000 uh, people who live there, uh, more than a third of whom are Southeast Asian refugees. And that community has had to, it's a, it's a southern village of 2,000 people with three Buddhist temples. You don't see that every day. And, and, uh, and they've had to try to come together in the wake of the devastations of Hurricane Katrina and pull together black, white, and Asian to rebuild the, the village. And they are doing it in a kind of uh, a way that's extremely impressive to me, not out of sort of a, a, a self-conscious liberalism that some of us developed in the 1960s, but out of, out of a, just a kind of uh, uh, down-home, live-and-let-live, uh, uh, simple, straightforward, um, you know, you and I are neighbors and that's all we need to know about each other kind of way. And it's really a remarkable story that's starting to develop there that, is the next thing I'm trying to chronicle, sort of journalistically and sort of historically. There were a couple of other hands. How much time? I don't know how much. One more question, okay. 
Anybody? Yes, ma'am. Did I allow him to read it? Not until uh, it was done. Um, I, I, <laughs> um, I, I didn't want it to be an authorized biography. I mean, I wanted it to have things in there that he would, um, uh, because I think if, if it's going to be balanced and, and it's going to be honest, um, that, it, that it would necessarily have things in there that he might not like. At the same time, it's a respectful book. I have great respect for Jimmy Carter, um, and that comes through in the book. But I try to be as hard-headed about what I see as his missteps um, as I am uh, laudatory about what I see as his great uh, contributions to the causes of peace and human rights, which I think you can't take away from him. I think the Nobel Committee got it right. They just got it late. You know, it should have, could have been a lot earlier. Thank you very much. Enjoy talking to you.